This is the third in a series of recordings on mixture designs. And of course, you should have watched the first two videos before watching this one. And you should have read the mixture uh, design notes part one and part two. So in the previous videos, we've talked about analyzing mixture designs. And in the cases we talked about, the uh, ingredients or mixture factors, ingredients if you're thinking of a recipe, could take on any value between 0 and 1. That is, they were all proportions. So it's possible to have runs in which it's 100% of a single ingredient, a pure component run. Or you could have binary and ternary combinations. But in practice, it turns out that quite often there are constraints on the mixtures. As an example, there are often ingredients that must be present all the time, or it wouldn't even be possible to have a mixture. And I use a simple example. You are trying to come up with a cake recipe. And you think of things like egg, uh, flour, milk, butter, possibly other ingredients. Well, I think you'd agree you couldn't do a mixture run in which it was 100% eggs, or 100% flour, or 100% milk. In other words, there have to be constraints on the ingredients, one or possibly all of them. And there are three forms of constraints. And we often call these regional constraints. And visually, you'll see why in a moment we refer to them as regional constraints. There's a lower bound. A minimum amount must be present. There can be an upper bound, in which case there's a maximum amount that can be present. And sometimes there's a constraint on the total amount. By definition, we typically assume the mixture components form 100% of the mixture. I'll show an example later on from uh, metallurgy where sometimes that's not true. And there could be a constraint. And the constraint could be less than 100% or 1. Okay. So let's start with a simple case. Each or let's not say each, but let's say at least one or more of the components has a lower bound. The, a minimum amount must be present. When this is the case, it turns out the resulting mixture space is what we call a convex polytope. Uh, in the case of lower bounds only, it's still a simplex. I'm going to show you that. Later, we're going to talk about odd shapes that can occur. These happen when there are upper and lower bounds. You can get some very oddly shaped regions. And as I'll show you, that can cause us some problems in terms of analysis. Okay. So let's start with the simple case. Um, let's assume I have Q components. Okay, and each one of them has a lower bound. So the Bound for the ith component, we'll call it L sub i. Okay. And once again, though, the settings of the factors must sum to 1. Well, it turns out when you have these bounds, in this case it's simple, there's a lower bound. As I mentioned, it does cause us some problems with analysis. And I'm going to visually show it to you in a moment. So we commonly rescale the settings, in other words, we do use the actual settings for to run the experiment. And then we rescale the components to something they call L pseudo components. I've never liked the term. It's a needless complication. Essentially, for analysis only, we're going to rescale the factors. Very analogous in factorial designs to use the plus minus 1 scaling for low and high settings. Okay. And on slide 5, I show you the rescaling. It's pretty simple. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. And I just want to show you one relationship on the right-hand side. Okay. 
What's nice about this, you can go back and forth between the original and the rescale components. In other words, they're just linear transformations of each other. So if I do the analysis in the pseudo component space, the analysis easily transforms back to the original scale. Okay. So I won't go through the uh, formulas. They're kind of tedious. It's easier to basically just show you a picture. So here's an example. I have three components and each has a lower bound. Okay. So L um, is 1 minus the sum of the lower bounds. So L turns out to be the denominator in our rescaling equation. By the way, L, what L does, it gives us the maximum stretching of the factors. In other words, it's the smallest denominator. It's based on the literally the smallest direction. So these x star are the rescale components. Again, we ran the experiment in the original scale. Um, the x stars, the rescaling, are for analysis. And I'll show you in a moment, Jump will typically do this scaling for you in advance. It's generally a good idea to use it. So on your left hand side is the experiment in the units you would actually use to run the experiment. Again, you'll see every run okay, sums to one. And on the right are the pseudo components that we use for the analysis. If you look at it, what it uh, in the rescaled units, what it is, is what we call a simplex centroid, a very simple type of design. So let's take a look at a picture. I think this really explains why we actually do the scaling. So I'm just going to outline the original unit, um, the original, yes, the, the region in the original units. Notice it's a small sub uh, triangle of the whole region. The problem is when we fit our model, and then we'll use, a, say, a Chaffee polynomial, that model has to extrapolate to the entire region. So this presents a problem because all of our data is in here, but we're going to extrapolate that model to the whole design region. The result of that is you can get some very unstable coefficient estimates. If you've had some training in regression analysis, this is referred to as the multicollinearity problem. In our case, let's just assume, because we're trying to extrapolate the model to a much larger region, our coefficients generally get inflated and unstable, and our model may be difficult to interpret and actually may be unstable. So the L pseudo components stretch the original region to cover the whole simplex space. And this generally gives us much better estimates of the coefficients. That is the reason for the rescaling. Okay. Okay. Well, similarly, you can have <clears throat> upper bound only constraints. Not surprisingly, these are often called U pseudo components. And those can be rescaled. By the way, uh, the, L, the lower bound constraints are by far the most common. Um, upper bound constraints by themselves are relatively rare. Lower bounds happen all the time. Because if you think about it, almost always at least some amount of one or more of the ingredients have to be present. Again, think of baking a cake and leaving out one of the primary ingredients. Okay. So some amount of it has to be there. The question is, how amount? Uh, how much? Well, you can also have upper bound constraints. And on slide 11, I show you the rescaling. Again, on the right, you can see the, the scaling is linear between x, the original units, and x star, the rescaled. Again, Jump will actually do this for you. You don't have to do it by hand.
but I show you uh, the formulas that are typically used. Okay. And then finally, I mentioned the case where the total amount is less than 1. So this presents a problem because um, we create these designs, we plot them, and we analyze them by triangular coordinates, which assumes the sum of the coordinates equals 1. If they don't, this becomes hard to analyze. But it turns out there's a simple trick that makes it easy to analyze the experiment. Just normalize each of the x's by the total amount c, and then do the analysis. In this x, I call it x double star components, and I will sum to 1. Okay, So here's a simple example. This is actually fairly common in some uh, disciplines. We're looking at an aluminum alloy, and the alloying elements are tin, copper, and lithium. Okay. Lithium is very popular as an alloying ingredient in the aerospace industry because you can produce an aluminum alloy that's relatively light but maintains pretty much the same strength as a traditional aluminum alloy without lithium. But generally for aluminum alloys, 92% of the mixture, again, uh, gravimetrically by weight, is aluminum. So my alloying components are only going to form 8% of the total. But don't be fooled, 8% is a lot of molecules. So here are my constraints. And C is 0 0.08. And for the analysis, I simply rescale the x's. And you can do this and jump, by the way, in the column info window. If the sum is less than 1, you can go in, select the mixture property, and then change the total. Plus, if you created it in jump, I'll show you later, you can tell jump the sum is less than 1, and it will do all the work for you. Okay. So again, on the left is the original units that you would work in. <clears throat> Again, the uh, experimenter would assume 92% is aluminum. And notice the rescaled units are once again a simplex centroid. So we can go ahead and do our analysis in the usual way. Okay. And well, it turns out that another issue that comes up is that quite often you get both constraints, both upper and lower. And I may have mentioned earlier, when you get both constraints, you tend to add, end up with some oddly shaped mixture regions that we will refer to as polytopes. Basically, that's a catch-all term in geometry for oddly shaped figures that don't naturally belong to a specific category. So in our next video, we're going to talk about these constraints and how to work with them and how to do analyses with them.